Welcome to Live in the Messiah's Love. I'm Kimisha Lucier, Senior Pastor of A Day of Prayer. And I am so glad that you are here. I love getting into the Word of God with you. And I love being a part of your growth and maturity in the Lord. It is such a blessing to me to be a part of your life in that way. Today's episode is called, Is This Bible Faith? Bible faith cooperates with God. David said in 2 Samuel 22 and Psalm 18, By you I can run upon a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. What David was saying here is that because of his God, he could do anything. Matthew 19 verse 23 says, But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. God wants us to do exploits in his name. We can't do those exploits without complete obedience to the Lord And we can't do them without right application of God's word and right understanding of his ordained spiritual principles. The word of God and our faith in the word of God are weapons for us. But for them to work properly in our own lives, we must understand them, what they are and how to use them. When we come to God as developing believers, we want to use our faith because we want to see God move. We want to experience his supernatural power working on our behalf in the earth. And this is normal. This is the the natural next step for any believer to want to start living by their faith and move into what God has for them. But we have to use our faith on purpose and we have to use it in the right way. So what is Bible faith? Let's look at Mark 11, verses 23 and 24. This is a popular um, scripture. If you've spent any time in your relationship with the Lord or been around church communities very long, and it says this, For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. This is a wonderful scripture. This is a scripture that will certainly inspire you and give you insight in how to use your faith and direction for your faith. And there's a a distinction in using this. You know, we've talked about not... um, trying to overturn God's uh, perfect timing. We've talked about, uh, you know, sometimes when it seems there's there's a delay, you know, not to give up on your faith, but realize it may be a matter of perfect timing or there may be an adversary standing in the way. But there's another dynamic that I want you to consider as we're thinking about faith. We just read that if we believe in our heart and we do not doubt that we'll have whatever we say. We'll have whatever we're asking God for when we pray. Now, the caveat is when we look at 1 John, it tells us if we ask according to the will of God, we know he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know we have the petition that we asked of our heavenly father. So what does that mean to us as, as children of God? It means that first we need to ask according to the will of God. Well, you might say, well, the Lord wants me to be happy. He wants me to have joy. You know, that's that's in the Bible. Absolutely. And God will not violate his own word. So if you ask for something um, that violates a covenant of God, he's not going to grant that request because it's outside of his will. And here's an example of what I mean. I have been in this place in my my own life, but I've also walked with other believers. And they'll say, I, I want something from God, so I'm going to create a situation where I can force God to act on my behalf. And that is a, a, a strategy that doesn't work because that's outside of how God wants us to come to him and he wants us to um, interact and engage with him. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4 to kind of see an example of what I mean. Uh, we're going to look at verses 5 through 7. It says, Then the devil took him up to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, 
He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. In this particular scenario, this is the Lord Jesus in his natural ministry. After he was baptized and the Holy Spirit descended upon him, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be uh, to fast for 40 days and then after that to be tested by the adversary. The Holy Spirit led him there. And in this time, the adversary comes to Jesus and he asks him to turn stone into bread. And that was an attempt to get Jesus to meet his own needs. And Jesus said, no, that's not, you know, he didn't partake of that. And then the next thing is the event that we just uh, read about in verses five through seven. So basically, the devil was asking Jesus to put himself in a situation to test God's love for him, to test God's willingness to act on his behalf. And Jesus responded with, not, I think that's a great idea. Not, I'm going to go do that, but he said, no, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So trying to create situations where we think we are going to force God to deliver us is is an ungodly reaction because that's what the adversary was showing up. There was no reason for Jesus to throw himself off the pinnacle just to see if God would do it. And When we look at our lives and we look at the life of Jesus Christ, we see that our Messiah listened to the guidance of the Holy Spirit for everything. As a matter of fact, he was out there because the Holy Spirit led him there. He was fasting because the Holy Spirit led him there. He wasn't trying to make his own situations and then ask the Holy Spirit to respond based on the situation that he created. The Lord was responding in light of what Holy Spirit was guiding. So that's a clear distinction and difference. And we are accountable to our God to know how to walk with him and to ask what is his will in a situation and then govern ourselves accordingly accordingly to rightly apply the word of God and not try to use it to manipulate our way into a situation or or try to in an an act of response from the Lord. He's already said that he's for us. He's already said that he's on our side. And as you mature, it's the right way to go to say, here's the situation that I'm facing, God. I believe you can do anything. Now, what do you say about it? This is what I read in your word, but guide me to the right application of your word in this circumstance, Lord. It may require some fasting to get your your flesh and your emotions under control. It may require that you turn off all the other voices and influences in your life so you can hear clearly from God. But this is a necessary step to make sure that we have accurately based and focused faith. So for Jesus to go, I'll take you up on that devil and dive off the side of the the pinnacle of the temple would have been an inappropriate and ungodly response, which is why Holy Spirit told him, don't don't go that way. This is how you handle the situation. Um, So for myself, for example, I've wanted God to do something for me and I'm, I'm trying to use my faith. So I have said, I will forgo the wisdom of God and I will forgo asking for counsel and I'll just set the situation up the way that I want it to work out. And then I'm going to pray about it and use the scriptures to um, get the result that I want. And I often found myself disappointed because that's not how the Lord wants us to come to him. Now, while we're young in the faith, we might feel like I did that before and it worked. And as you mature, you will see that in order for you to have a consistent response from our Heavenly Father and consistently tap into the provision that's provided for you, you need to go the right way. You need to go through the proper door. You know, when you have a, a two-year-old and, and he pops through your, your screen on your sliding glass door, you might, you might give a little bit more accommodation to them versus when they're 30 and they, they pop through the screen on your sliding glass door. You go, why didn't you just open the door and come in? Or why didn't you knock if you needed help? So God, in the same way, wants us to take the proper direction. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, to get some more insight and understanding. This is the Lord's Prayer. This is the disciples asked how they should pray when they were speaking with the Lord, and this is what he said. He said, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And that's a scripture that we pray a lot in the as we become and become believers and we come into the body of Christ. But sometimes we can substitute what's written here for what we think is supposed to be happening. We'll say, uh, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that is, that's a, a, a mishandling, if you will, of that scripture. God wants us to be submitted to his will. And in everything, he's provided a solution. In every temptation, every circumstance that we face, he has provided his word to deal with it. He's provided the answer. He's provided help via the Holy Spirit. He's provided the ministering angels to minister for heirs of salvation. And when you look closely at scripture, you see that the angels hearken to the voice of his word, in our mouth, not our, our our thoughts or our thinking about it. So our faith is not designed to overturn the perfect will of God. That's a, another connection that we might see to God's perfect timing, where the Lord is like, you know, the Messiah is coming on this particular day. And we're like, well, we need him now. We want him to come today. We It would be better suited for us if he could come today. Well, that that's not what our faith is used for. Remember, we don't take the weapons of our warfare. We don't take the armor of God and use it to fight against our God. That's not its design purpose. We use it to do kingdom business in the earth. We use it to maintain the boundaries that the Lord has set up and we occupy them by faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, here's something I want to examine in the word of God that can maybe be a little bit, um, I'll say hard to understand when you're just looking at circumstances, when you're just reading through the scriptures. There's a difference between God initiated intercession and trying to force God to do something that isn't a part of his will. We know it's always his will to heal, heal. He's already said that. It's our always his will his will to bless us. He's already said that. It's our always his will to prosper us and to do us good. He's already said that. How he goes about doing it is according to his good pleasure. He's already told us that he wants to do it, but how he goes about carrying it out, we need to understand that he's got a perfect way of doing that. And our job is to find out from the Holy Spirit what he wants to have done. How he wants to work it out. Yes, he is going to do it, but how does he want it done? And then to submit ourselves to his way and his direction. When we use our faith, we always use it in present tense. It's never past or future. If it's in the future, it's hope. Um, we always use it. It's present tense. So as we read Mark 11, we received it at the moment that we prayed and the having it part that belongs to God, how he carries it out. As far as we're concerned, it was done the moment that we prayed. It's instant. We have it. And when we see it before our natural eyes, that belongs to God. That, that's in Holy Spirit's power. So Mark, I mean, Matthew 26, verse 39 says this. It says, he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So this is submission by, by God to the will of the father, right? Lord Jesus is the son of the living God. And while he is not subjugated as in lower, he is submitted to the divine order of God. And even when faced with the most terrible situation any human has ever faced, no one has ever compared to what he suffered. He still said, I know there's another way, but it's not what I want. It's what you want. You can do anything, God. And this is your best. This is your perfect will. I will humble myself and I will submit to it and I will obey and agree with you, Lord. And I will keep walking in the path that you have for me. And God initiated intercession is something that we also see in the word of God that could give the appearance if misunderstood that the Lord wants us to overturn his will. So let's look at um, Genesis chapter 18 and verse 17. 
in this section of scripture, the Lord came to visit Abraham and he was on, the Lord was on his way to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said in verse 17, the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And I'll keep reading just a little bit. Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation and in him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. If you continue reading, you'll see that the Lord tells Abraham that he was going to destroy the city and Abraham intercedes and asks the Lord and petitions God based on God's righteousness to spare the righteous and not destroy the righteous with the, the wicked. And, you know, Abraham keeps talking and asking all the way till they get down to um, a select number of, of individuals. And the Lord agrees with him and says, um, let's see, look, verse 32. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the 10. So Abraham was asking if the Lord would spare 10 righteous, if he would save the city because there were 10 righteous there. God came to him because he was giving Abraham an opportunity to intercede. In the word, the Lord says the Lord was looking to provide redemption and provide mercy, but there was no one to stand in the gap. So intercession is God's way. That's his ordained strategy to help those who have not necessarily asked him directly to help for themselves because maybe they didn't know, maybe they were unaware. You know, there's a variety of reasons, but God uses intercession and intercessors to give him permission to work on behalf of his people in the earth so that he is able by righteous means and legal standards, if you will, to provide that assistance where it may not be legally provided or legally allowed to provide because there's spiritual laws in play in another way. So, and I'm not talking about man's laws, I'm talking about spiritual laws. So in this case here, God needed Abraham to intercede for the righteous people in that city, and in particular, Lot. Lot was Abraham's nephew. So God was giving him a chance to stand in the gap for his nephew and his nephew's family to allow them to be delivered because the righteous response for the wickedness that was happening is destruction. The wages of sin is death. And so the Lord said, hey, the the, the receipt has come for this. The payment is due on their activities in this city, and I need someone to stand in the gap so your family can be delivered. That's God initiated intercession. And like I said, God created intercession. So he wants us to intercede on the behalf of others. And with that, cooperate with his will. It was God's will to deliver Lot. He wanted to do that because he's merciful to all generations. God is good to all. And in the midst of that, he was giving Abraham the chance to speak with him. So Abraham could have kept going all the way to one. And the Lord, because of his mercy, his great mercy and his great grace would have allowed him to do that. Abraham stopped at 10 and the Lord was um, satisfied with that. And that still provided him to deliver less than 10 people in that particular situation. So again, both of these, when we looked at the comparison of Jesus in the garden, laying down his own will in a situation, and when we looked at Abraham, when it seemed like he was overturning the will of God, we see that he wasn't. He was actually cooperating with it. And even when you look at when the Lord talked to Moses and said, you know, get out of the way. I'm going to deal with these people and destroy them and I'll make a nation out of you. That's because God was giving Moses an opportunity to intercede for them. The people had heaped up for themselves destruction, according to their words, and all of the people would have suffered as a result of that. Their parents were speaking over their children, and God needed a way to preserve the children that would be coming up so that they would not be destroyed and washed away with their parents. Now, remember who our God is. His will is to do good for us. So we don't have to wrestle against his perfect will. That is where we are absolutely safe and we can trust him. We can always rely on how the Lord feels and how he judges a situation. But when we look at it with our natural mindsets, when we look at it from a fleshly perspective, we miss God. And when we try to take our faith and overpower God or overturn his perfect will and his good pleasure, we end up feeling disappointed because we're trying to insert our own will in the situation. 
Now, as I said, God's good pleasure is to give us the desires of our heart. And in that, when you think about when you come to God, sometimes there's some wicked desires in your heart and there's desires that you haven't thought out all the way, that you haven't considered what the outcome and the end result would be if you actually were given that petition. But God knows he is a good God. He sees the end from the beginning. And when you allow him, he will protect you even from you and say, well, come, come to me, my love. I want you to talk to me. I want you to know that I'm going to bless you, but I need you to understand what I'm doing. I need you to understand how I want to go about getting this done so you can come in alignment and agree with me. Remember, when we agree as touching anything, our Father is there in the midst. Our Lord and Savior is there in the midst and there to bless. That even includes us agreeing with God's perfect will. That even includes us agreeing with the word of God. He's always there and he's on it and he's ready to act. Now, when we think about our lives, sometimes we feel like um, a damsel in distress process uh, will move God. If it's a, a, an emotional situation, that will move God. And it doesn't. The word of God says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. They that come to him must first believe that he is, that he exists, and that he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Now, look at that word diligent there. It's not hap- haphazardly. It's not half-heartedly. It is going, Lord, I'm looking for you. I'm looking for your will. I'm looking for your plan, God. And I believe that you are going to reward me with the good answer, with the right answer, because he knows everything. And as I said, you know, as we we become more and more aligned, more renewed in our mind, you'll find that, Lord, I didn't want to eat that whole cake after all. Thank you, Lord, for giving me wisdom and and altering my thoughts in that situation so that I could make an accurately and a wise and a good decision. I heard a testimony once of a, a woman who was believing God for supernatural protection and safety. And she was leaving a, you know, an establishment and it was getting close to evening. And the Lord said to her, don't walk down that alley, take another way. And she said, well, I'm going to go this way because I know God will protect me. So the woman walked through the alley and she was mugged and robbed as she went through the alley. And when she was, you know, taken to the hospital or, you know, um, rescued from that plan by the police or whatnot, she was upset with God and it caused her to question, um, you know, her relationship with the Lord, the word of God, all of these other things. And she found herself in that place because she didn't understand how God moved. God gives us wisdom. God told her, don't go down the alley. That was God keeping his promise. And it was her job to obey that wisdom, not go, I want to do it this way. Now you bless it, Lord. Remember, it's not your kingdom come and my will be done, Lord. It's not the forces of of heaven and the angels are coming to carry out my personal will or your personal will. They're here to do the will of the father. That's where their loyalty lies. And as we align ourselves with him, that's when we see the, the alignment and the pouring out of consistent blessing. That's when we see that um, consistent victories in our life because the angels are like, thank you. I can do the will of God. Thank you. You're giving me something to work with. And they appreciate that. So they can just go ahead and do their job as well. God needs his people in the earth to give him permission to act and to show mercy. So remember that as you're praying, as you're looking and considering your life and and believing God, remember that you can trust him. Remember that his divine plan is just that. It is divine and it's perfect. I want to leave you with this. When you're praying for others and you're using your faith on behalf of others, use it in a way that opens the door to allow God into their life in his perfect will. Especially when uh, ladies, as you're praying for your husbands, husbands, as you're praying for your wives, parents, as you're praying for your children, where it's, it's tempting to make and to want to ask God to do things the way we want it done. We, we want God to do our will. We think we know best for them. But God, those are his creations. He died for them. He loves them more than we ever could. And he has a perfect plan that will not only cause that person to please the Lord and live a life that pleases God, but it'll also cause the person to be fulfilled and satisfied. They may not be fulfilled with what I think should happen in their life. They may not be fulfilled with what you think should happen in their lives. Consider this how you would feel if this were, were you on the receiving end of that prayer. And I was praying for you what I thought was best for your life. 
Well, I don't know. I'm not God. So same, same saying when we are praying for others, we're not God. But the one who is knows how to take care of situations. So don't pray according to fear. Don't pray according to your will. Pray according to God's perfect will. Ask the Lord to do his perfect will. Invite him to do his perfect will in that person's life and watch them be spectacularly and miraculously changed. I want to recommend a book to you today that will help you with your faith and help you learn principles for what faith is and what it's not. It's called Bible Faith Study Course by Kenneth E. Hagan. Brother Hagan is a trusted voice in the the um, Christian community. He had a life of believing God and seeing miracles and receiving from God on a consistent basis. And that book was life-changing for me as I began to study the Word of God. And there's lots of scriptures. There's questions at the end of the book. And it will help you um, kind of focus and, and clarify some things that you may have thought in the past were faith, but they're actually not. And also couple it with the teachings that we're going over in this podcast so that it provides more clarity and more understanding of how to use the information that you're learning, how to use the, the word of God that's being imparted unto you so that you become victorious in every area and capacity of your life. That's all I have for you today. I can't wait to meet with you right back here next week. If you have a moment, please subscribe, share, and follow my channel on um, Facebook or uh, YouTube any of those kind of things, check us out a day of prayer. And you can also look for live in the Messiah's love. And I just wanted to remind you to live your life in the Messiah's love. God bless you.